Okay. Is everybody with me? Okay. Let me see. A couple of you. Let's see. Everybody's anonymous today. Um. Okay. I mentioned in here, I mentioned in that last email to you guys that, uh, um, I think I did, I don't know, at least I did the other class, I'll send, I'll send a reminder to you guys. Um, I mentioned in this um, a couple of times that, um, um, that it's a two week drawing, but it isn't. So this project description in parts, parts of it, uh, we'll relay that it's a two-week drawing, but I do put in here that it's Friday, the, the uh, second, April second. So um, that I want to do. So it's only going to be a one-week drawing. So in so much it's going to be a one-week drawing, it's not going to be a kind of. I don't want you to, you know, it's. We're, I think students get in trouble with drawing and art generally is um, um, trying to pretend they have more time on something than they actually do. So then you get in a panic, and um, you work quickly. Hey, David, you here? Oh, yes, I am. How you doing? Good, good. How are you? Good, good. Hanging in there. Um, so this drawing will hopefully reflect that it's a, a probably a five-hour drawing, maybe four or five-hour drawing, something like that, okay? Uh, just a week's worth of work uh, in the semester. So, um, um, so keep that in mind, and I'll get to that in a second in terms of this, this idea of value. Judy's coming in. Uh, Judy, you there? Hey, how you doing? Good. That's good. Sorry, oh, that's okay. That's all right. Um, okay, so as we did with the first uh, uh, vessel, right? Because I just wanted to get your feet wet with this idea. Um, the uh, um, notion of um, culling form, culling, culling, not calling, culling, you know, pulling something out, pulling form out of um, the ether, as it were, right, out of atmosphere, um, without relying on outline is a very difficult thing to do. Um, but I think that it kind of really um, changes the way one sees the world and also the one way one makes art. It's kind of a shift in mindset in a certain way, um, philosophy, if you will. Uh, so uh, I kind of really focus on that in terms of this um, this uh, this project, this project that deals with value, uh, volumetric rendering value. As I say up there, a subtler and more refined set of scribbles. Okay, uh, there's different ways to gain value. Uh, you know, the the parallel hatches we'll do in the next project is one way um, to uh, you know do lights and darks in a drawing. Um, so to uh, charcoal. That with, with charcoal, you're blending. You know, you're kind of pushing the material around, blending, pushing, pulling, adding, subtracting. So it's a kind of a more plastic uh, process in a certain way. This is all additive, okay? And this is a pretty traditional technique uh, uh, applying graphite in this in this manner. Printmakers do that use this a lot, uh, as well as uh, parallel hatching, because they can use a, a, a refined, you know, like etch, if you're doing an etching or um, you know something like that, you can use a really fine tip. Uh, tool to etch into the plate uh, or etch into the, the, the asphalt on the plate. Um, so the tip becomes all important, right? In this case, it's the same way. So this is why I focus on this idea of the scribble. And we do the exercise of the scribble, right? Uh, and then I had you try to draw an object with the scribble. Um, um, and I think, uh, you know, uh, uh, you guys did a pretty good job with that. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a technique that is really important because it also engenders that idea of a sense of touch, okay? And that's really important in making a drawing. And that's a communicative activity, right? The, you draw, make a drawing with a sense of nuance and a sense of touch, the viewer receives that, right? And that's part of the, that's part of the, uh, the communication, right? That's part of the expressive uh, dialogue that goes on. Um, so um, that's a really important aspect. So that's why I really focused on that for that, and ask you to do a drawing, by the way, that third one, right, in that series, um, uh, um, that, you know, could almost not see. And some of you got there, right? You know, and I trusted you that you spent the uh, appropriate amount of time on it. <laughs> no, I could tell. Um, so that there's this really fine mesh of marks, right? And it's just, it just, it's just, if, we're not, if you're not used to it, it just trains you to kind of see 
art making and, the, and, and also see the world in a different way, um, I think. Um, so I'm a big advocate of that. Okay, so you know you can kind of review all this stuff on your own. Uh, you know, I got, kind of go over some of the, um, um, you know, the kind of things I want you to think about in the creation of the drawing. You know, the kind of set, setting the stage here. Essentially, and I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about it today. This idea of lighting the drawing, how to light the drawing. Okay, because that's a really important thing. Um, uh, and we're for this one, we're using charcoal. Right? No, we're not. No, not yet. Not no, yet. That's yet. that's the last uh, drawing of the semester. Yeah, this is still graphite. Okay, next two drawings we're going to do, David, will be graphite. Okay, uh, and then charcoal will be the last last drawing of the semester. Okay, um, I personally love charcoal, so you know I would probably do <laughs> charcoal for the whole semester if it was up to me. But uh, um, or if it was. I, that's not the way I should put it. It is up to me. You know, I could do that if I wanted to. But. Um, but um, if I was not being fair to you guys, I would do charcoal the whole semester because then I would be excluding graphite, and I think that's really important. So, but I love that graphite too. But charcoal is just such a powerful medium. Um, okay, so you can go, you can read all over the drawing once you make. It's got one to two objects, you know, as I as I note here, one to two objects, right? One is a tough. Just one is probably good. Okay, um, one one to two objects that will be done in such a way that uh, uh, you'll be rendering the, the volumes, and I'll go over that in a second, and the, the edges via relative value, okay? And that gets tricky, because we, and I see this endlessly with students, that all they do is they focus on the thing. They'll draw the thing and forget the background, okay? So uh, with that cup drawing, of course, right, you, we realize that, uh, um, realize that it's also about the background and the dark around the thing, right? Let's see if I have any examples of that here. Yeah, you can see here in this light bulb right here. And I got a series of light bulbs here, by the way, that students did. Uh, I sent those out, I think. You, I don't know if you guys saw those or not, but they're nice to work. Now, this is a longer project, right? So um, this is probably a two, this may even be a three week project. I don't know, we did that. These were done in class, right? I provided the light bulb and I painted them. Why'd you paint them, Blake? Why'd you, why in the world would you paint a light bulb? Um, because it, easier, what's that? What? I was gonna say, is it because it would be easier to see the lighting? Yes, yeah, it, it creates a more matte surface, right? Because the light bulb has a, has a, number one, it's shiny, and number two, it's translucent, right? So the light's gonna go into the light bulb and you're not gonna get that nice sense of reflection across it. So I don't expect you, if you choose a light bulb, to paint your light bulb. Um, they're still good to draw, you know, they're still, they're still good to draw. But you can see here, uh, this one is a nice example, I think. Let's see if I can zoom in here. Getting a little, I cut it off a little bit at the top when I group these. But obviously the top of this light bulb right here is a highlight. So the student had to spend a lot of time just playing out here into the in the background. See those really beautiful scribbles? Now eventually they, they gather and they gather and they get darker and they get darker and they get darker. But when I've watched when I look at this drawing, it's that's not just a dark area in the background. It's a vibration. It's a sense of subtlety. It's a sense. It's a sense of uh, dedication. It's it's this, the artist telling me, "I love you, viewer, and I love you so much. I'm going to spend a ton of time out in Nowheresville here. Okay, because I want the drawing to look complete. I want the whole surface of the drawing, the whole picture plane, to have the same vibe going on. Now, obviously, down at the bottom here, you let up. Right? Just don't do as many down here. Okay, so that's the idea I'm talking about in terms of the gathering of these marks, thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. Now, we're only working a week on this, so we can't gain the value, the dark value that they did in these drawings, okay? So I'll talk about the value scale here in a second, and, and that'll make sense to you. Um, the, but obviously, we can see the edge of this light bulb here because this area is bright and not many marks, and this area is dark and a lot of dense marks, right? Okay? So it, there's, a, there's a relationship between thing and non-thing, okay? That's why they call it nothing. It's non-thing, in, in, meaning inferring that there is a thing, and it's just not there right now, okay? That's a kind of existential philosophical idea there, but, um, but that's what art is. So, and then reflected light down here, of course, and then the cast shadow acts as a foil to that. Okay. 
So these drawings are made as a result of just honing these edges in over time. Here's a nice example from last fall. Now this one happens to be a they were drawing roots, so this was kind of a tree limb root. This was a couple, well, four or five years ago, probably at least. Um, <laughs> what's that? I said I really like the colored one. It yeah. almost looks like a, something you've seen in a tree. It, in, in a what, David? In, a, in like a dream. It, oh yeah, 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 absolutely. That's a very good, uh, very, very good analogy there. It's a very misty sort of uh, atmospheric sort of thing, right? And that lends itself to this what you're saying, David, this kind of dreamlike quality to the thing. And this is just a series of very light, multicolored scribbles, right? It's the same technique. This is a drawing to student, and I really like the drawing. But same process here, right? Just scribble, 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 another color, scribble, scribble, scribble. Impressionistic, the impressionists work this way, um, you know, of, of course, you know. Um, you know, they would lay, it's called optical blendings, where you, like the, the shadow here is blue, yellow, uh, uh, purple, you know, all those colors blend together when you see it from a distance. So that's called optical blending. And by the way, this is kind of optical blending in a certain way too, because it's just marks on a sheet of paper, right? So they all gather and, and come together and we see it as one big swath of value, for instance, okay? Um, so I, I, I brought this one up because it's the same technique. I'd forgotten about this, but I really like the drawing. Um, but using that scribble technique only with pastel. No blending with the pastel, it's just layering, okay? So it's a really nice way to kind of uh, create, um, uh, you know, create, uh, in this case, color color transition and value. There's value in there as well. Values light and dark colors, hue, which is a, a different thing. But, um, but both are existing in this left drawing. Now this right drawing is nice, uh, you know, because what I like about this, you can kind of see a, a real freedom and not, not worrying about making these edges super crisp, right? Look at that beautiful transition. It's just this wonderful. So what that does is it tends to make the drawing look more formful, more volumetric, because you're not relying on a crisp edge to create the uh, drawing. Um, now these are wonderful drawings, but you can kind of see, now one might say, oh, that's more realistic because it's cleaner, right? But one might argue also it's flatter because this edge is so defined along here. So it feels more like a cut out piece of paper pasted on the background. Not really, but I'm, I'm exaggerating there. But compare that to this, right? So this is all about form and less about shape, right? Just the, the roundness, you know, the highlights like right here in the bulb. And then as it moves to the edge, it gets a little, uh, more dark, a little darker in value, just a little bit, and you get to where the background starts and darker yet. But there's no clear cut edge there yet. It's a beautiful drawing. Look at that. It's just a really wonderful drawing. Again, like David's talking about, that it has a kind of sense of atmosphere and almost dreamlike state uh, with the tennis, tennis ball and the light. But also, the other thing is, I know that's a tennis ball and I know that's a light. I wouldn't, I'd be hard pressed to not know that, even though it's not clearly defined by a crisp outline. Okay. And marks everywhere, of course. Now, did the artist take this background value and go all the way out to the edge? No, and that's okay. At least they didn't kind of just stay right here and create a, a sharp line around it. They feathered it into there with that really light sense of touch, okay? Playing out as they move out into the background with marks. Okay, so one to two objects. Um, that are lit, and I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, and then you set up, uh, you know, a space for yourself so you can kind of isolate them, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, I have a a, um, a bunch of images on the Google Drive there. I, it's in the it's in the document I sent out to you. So if you want to look at these, these are samples of uh, using this pencil technique as a uh, way to create. Uh, uh, rendering in a drawing. So um, I think I talked about that the other day with you guys. So you can kind of assess that uh, as well, okay? Uh, and look at all, all the stuff that goes on there. Um, so I did a, a, a video of, this will take you to a playlist, the link in there will take you to a playlist of drawing the, um, of th a couple different videos. Here's one that I kind of narrate where I'm, I'm uh, talking about um, uh, in a drawing, another uh, branch that we did the aspects of, of different drawings that we've done over the years, okay? So using this idea of scribble and value relationship purely to create the image, okay? Um, 
So there's that in the, in the, in the playlist. There's also, I talk uh, uh, quite a bit, I do a narrated piece about a, an egg I drew, okay? Um, so you might want to take a look at that as well. Now, this egg, by the way, you're drawing, you can create your drawing on a half sheet of paper. If you want to make a whole sheet of paper, that's fine, but that's a lot of territory to cover for four hours, given the amount of marks I want you to make on this drawing, okay? Um, so I drew an egg one time on a half sheet of paper, and I lost the four, four versions of it, so I, I was just left with two. But I compare in this video uh, the two, ver two versions. I think it's probably a second version and um, second stage of the drawing and um, the final stage. If I, can, I think it's here somewhere. There we go. So that's like the first, or that's like the second stage probably. It's not just, it's not real light, but it's starting to kind of, uh, the, the marks are starting to kind of uh, gather in the right places, et cetera, et cetera. But notice the, um, you know, how, how kind of loose it is, right? There's a, it's rather scribbly at this point. Um, but then I spent, I don't know how, many, how long I spent on this one, maybe 15 hours because of the, the refined quality to it. Um, by the time it was done, let me see if I can get in there to, you know, a ton more scribbles, right? No erasing. Those scribbles start to cancel each other out, right? And that's why it's important when you do your scribbles, and I talked to some of you guys about this, uh, to have it be not non-systematic, your scribble movement, okay? And I know that sounds kind of like trite or something, or I'm, I'm being picky, but um, you don't want to loop, because if you have to fill in empty areas using that loop motion, spiral motion, it's not going to be easy. It's, that spiral is not going to always fit into certain areas that you need to kind of fill in in order to make the thing look complete, okay? Or if you have a kind of overt zigzag with your mark making. That's why the scribble, the randomness, and I, I, but it's kind of random, kind of not, using an up, down, left, right movement, just da, 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 just scribble, I'm scribbling, I'm free, I'm free, I'm scribbling. Now I'm scribbling lightly and I'm scribbling small, but I'm scribbling, okay? Um, is really important here because you can overlay and, and you can kind of focus your scribble in such a way that you can start to fill in areas as you develop the great gradation on this thing, right? The modeling shadow, I'll talk about that in a second. So the way you apply these marks will lend itself to making it look smoother at the end of the drawing, okay? More refined. Um, creating also, by the way, as you go, a real sense of density in both the drawing and the illusory object you're creating. Because all these little marks, thousands of them, coalesce and they create a vibration and then they create a sense of weight and density in the viewer's mind. Okay, And that's why we don't take our thumb and smudge those marks away. It's because you get rid of all that energy you put into the drawing. We, we, I often see this in high school students. They're used to smudging because they're taught that smudging. And smudging can be okay. It's okay. But um, I tend to not do that with, with graphite. I just let the graphite be in its original state of just a little mark on a piece of paper, right? I think that's more um, natural. Um, so, so you develop this gradation by just putting marks. Just keep going with it. I'm going to strategize a little bit. Oh, I know there's going to be a dark band around here, right, to create that modeling shadow across this form. So I'm just going to hang out here more. And then at the end of the drawing, I might press a little harder, or I might even get a softer pencil, okay, when I'm ready to do that. But you realize that's 10 hours into a drawing, maybe, to get this dark. And that dark down there, definitely, okay. Okay. So the, the problems that this creates for us is... are these transition points. And this is all back to lighting. So tell me, when, what's lighter here, the egg or the background? The egg. Yep. What's lighter here, the egg or the background? Background. Yeah. All right. So there's got to be a transition point somewhere where they are one and the same, right? That no man's land, right? So it's okay for that to happen in a drawing, and that soft or that uh, tennis ball and the light bulb is an indication of that not being overly concerned about always closing off the object from the background. Okay, 
But notice to get, get that, I have to, as I scribble on the egg, I go more scribbles and a little darker as I move down on the egg. And in the background, I do the opposite. More scribbles up here and let up as I move down. That creates that value transition, okay? Now, if you outline the thing and draw it, you're not forced into making those decisions. You're not, your eye is not forced into seeing those transition points and knowing and, and really understanding those value transition points. That's why I don't let students outline these things. Okay? You can do it if you're really good at seeing that stuff and you want a real complicated drawing, you've got to map it in and all that, go real light. And a lot of people do that. But in terms of learning, I don't want you to draw the outline Okay, because um, it doesn't force your eye to see those value transitions. Okay, it's the only way you're going to create shape, i.e., form in this drawing is through those value transitions along edge. So it's all edge, not outline. Um, okay. Down here, obviously, let's see if I have a little detail shot of that. Right there, it gets real complicated where that cast shadow is. So, and you can also see what I love about this too is the texture of the paper starts to emerge. So there's a real tactile quality and it gets us a shared experience with the viewer. There's a tactile quality uh, with a really nice drawing on a sheet of paper. The paper, the tooth, they call it the tooth of the paper, starts to talk as well. And you, teeth talk. Uh, uh, the tooth of the paper, which is the uh, texture of it, starts to become part of the process, okay? It's the way the pencil scrapes across it. Now the brute doesn't care about that. The brute will just kind of lay a dark uh, uh, pencil on it, you know, just kind of scribble as dark as possible, not even be aware of the texture of the paper saying something in the drawing, okay? So it creates this kind of flittering light quality, you know, if you're really sensitive to that, right? See these little specks of white? Those are areas that are recessed in there that never got the, the graphite, right? So it's a really beautiful, yet yeah, there's an overall value to the thing, right? It's really nice. Um, part of the charm of actually doing a drawing rather than a digital drawing. So transition here, cast, really dark cast shadow down at the bottom. A little bit lighter down there for the reflected light, which we talked about. No man's land here, where the shadow, the lighter shadow of the cast shadow and the egg uh, blend in together. And then all of a sudden, egg darker, background real light, okay? And that's dependent on your lighting technique, which I'll talk about here, okay? You gotta really think about lighting in order to uh, to do an effective uh, observation based drawing. There's no getting around it, okay? All right. Okay, so back to value here. So, you know, we talked about this last time too as well. This kind of, this is, and the reason I do this is to repeat it, is because, you know, repetition, you know, helps in terms of learning. Um, let me make it bigger. Again, uh, there's relative contrast as you move around the edge of the thing. It's kind of just repeating here. Dark in the background, highlight here. Highlight is the light area, right? Modeling shadow is that transition on the form between the highlights and the, the cache or the, the, the um, darker shadow, okay? So this would be the darker shadow. And we call that a modeling shadow, but it just isn't there. It's everywhere as it moves up into the light area, okay? So there's a gradual transition from what the dark part of the modeling shadow to the new medium part of the modeling shadow right there to the highlight, the light part of the modeling shadow. That's still modeling shadow because there's still scribbles there, right? It's just that they read differently. So in a simple way, it would be this is the shadow on the bulb and this is the highlight on the bulb. And the whole movement across from light to dark is the modeling shadow, okay? That's rendering the roundness of the form, the volumetric nature of it. Um, and then we got the cast shadow down here, right? And then we could talk about reflected light before, okay? Any questions so far? So all that stuff you got to think about, right? It's not just, being an artist is not just reactive, right? It's pro-reactive. You do both. You know, you, you think ahead, um, and then you react in the moment. And a lot of people just think it's just about being kind of expressing yourself and being re being reactive in the moment. It's both of those things, okay? Here's an example of, you know, it's not just drawing an egg, but a portrait. So, um, again, the, uh, you know, the this eye looked like 
or this eye looked like this eye, right? And all those things are in this more complex form, right? The, the eye socket, the eye, all that stuff, modeling shadow, highlight, reflected light, all that stuff is in there, okay? But realize that no erasing took place, just fine tip pencil, scribbling in the right place, going dark at the right time, creates that structure, no outline to create that, okay? So it can, you can kind of take this where you want to take it in terms of developing your technique. So um, this idea of value then, um, relative value. Let's say a finished drawing, a 10 hour, uh, 15 hour drawing, has a value scale from zero. They're, these look the same here, but they're really, you know, didn't read very well. But this, this would be a one down here or up here. And let's call the darkest dark in the drawing 100, okay? This is a value scale of 100, okay? Um, and you could do a value scale of 1,000, right? The darkest dark is still going to be the, equal to the darkest dark of 100, right? It's not, you're not increasing darkness. What you're increasing is the steps between absolute white and absolute dark. Ostensibly, the more value shifts you have in a drawing, the more complete the drawing, right? Just like looking at a... a uh, a um, video or you know on a, a pixels on a screen you know the more pixels the better the resolution right? so that's the same with the more values in a, in a black and white drawing the more resolution you're gonna have in the drawing right so like in this egg drawing maybe you have a thousand different values in a thousand different areas I don't know you know but maybe our drawing though you can have drawings that are limited value scale and my point was uh, at the beginning here was if you make if you try to make the drawing finished when it doesn't want to be finished, it's going to look uh, stilted and artificial and not the that the well the rendering will of the, the illusory part of you know that's a cup sitting on a table will look artificial right, but also the drawing will will feel out of whack itself right it won't have an honesty to it okay so. My suggestion would be to limit your value scale here, okay? Don't try to go super, super, super dark uh, with, your, with your drawing, okay? You know, maybe if this is, represents right here a, a kind of a third about of the, of the overall value scale here. You can see the darkest dark is not anywhere near that 100 dark, right? Okay? So limit your value scale, number one. Number two, work your drawing in such a way that you're, you're pulling out these values all at once. Don't fill in one area. Never fill in one area and call it done. Okay, that's a coloring book technique. You're always pushing and pulling and moving across the picture plane and developing the darks as you develop the mediums, as you develop the lights, as you develop, and then you're going back and you're darkening up a little bit more and blah, 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 blah. Moving back and forth. Don't fixate on one area in terms of development of value, okay? Because uh, that'll get you in trouble. Because there's no way to know for sure how dark something should be until you can relate it to the whole drawing, not just one part of the drawing. That's the relative value thing. And it's something called uh, global versus local value. I don't know if I mentioned it in here. So local value would be the two values that are next to one another. Now, people are pretty good at discerning that uh, usually. But what they're not good at is seeing that, that one that value in that little local scheme and relating it across the whole drawing to something else. So that might be way out of whack relation to something across the drawing. That's global value. So my point is, in terms of developing the whole drawing, see it as a global experience. Global, 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 global. Then as you develop it, you can kind of get a little more nuanced in terms of this versus this in, this, in the areas next to each other. Okay, It's really a tricky wicket to navigate, so that's the idea of relative value. So think in those terms too. Is it a local value I'm trying to create right now, or is it something related over across the drawing? It should be kind of both at the same time if you really think about it carefully. Okay. Okay. So Blake, yeah. Um, a question because I I was thinking about what I might draw, and I was thinking about using a yellow delicious apple. Mm -hmm. But That's, then that, I'm thinking no, that, that could be more challenging because it's going itself, and so I, I'm being distracted by color versus value. Yeah. Yep, that's, um, that's a really good question. So, yep. so it would be better just to choose a white candle? Because <laughs> <laughs> Well, we live in a world of color. So I'm going to talk about that here in a second when I when we light this. Okay, I'll, I'll talk about that. Right. Um, but I think a yellow delicious, delicious apple would be a good one, actually. Um, you know, um, I never thought about a, 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 What's the, give me, what is a Macintosh? Uh, not so much because of the dark values, okay? And I'll talk about that in a second, okay? But that's a really good uh, point. Um, so that might be a good choice. That might be a good, really good choice. Yeah. Um, okay. I, I also have a question. Um, yeah. 
I'm not sure what's due this Friday, so I'm sorry I'm a little oh, oh. way off. Just one drawing. And should it be complete, or are, is this a two-week project? No, this one? is one week. Yeah, this is one week. Maybe okay. I mentioned, I might have mentioned that, Judy, before you jumped in. Uh, I do uh, mention okay. in a couple areas here uh, that, um, that because this, I use this, uh, um, um, you know, the sheet I sent out here uh, when we were doing this as a two-week drawing. Yeah. So, um, and I, I'll send out a reminder to you guys, just to let you know, pay no attention to those parts of this document because it is just a one-week drawing, okay? Well, if you scroll back up, you say, um, in these, in, yeah. in the paragraph yeah. above the chart, it says the first yeah. pay, Don't pay attention to that. Right? Yeah, yeah, don't pay attention to that. So the finished drawing, should we go for the right or should we go for... Um, oh, for, no, I go mean, for this because it's only a one-week drawing. Don't don't overshoot. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. If it were, time. yeah. If it were a two-week drawing, then go for this. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. That's Great. that's a Thanks. that's point. I wasn't being absolutely clear about that. I went through this and I was like, I oh, I changed that because uh, we're said uh, Friday, April, whatever, April second or whatever. Oh, I got okay. that. It's like I got this. I got this. I, I fixed it, you know. And then I didn't read down <laughs> the rest, <laughs> rest of the way. And it gets go oh, goes into detail about you know this is week one, this is week two. So uh, okay. yeah, and I'll send a reminder out to everybody. So yeah, that's why I'm bringing up this point of. Um, just I'm happy with it to be kind of a third of the value scale working lightly okay I am I am enjoying learning how to do this because and so because now I'm actually learning how to actually shade uh-huh because be, before I used to struggle with shading without making it a giant smear smear right yep yeah it's it, it teaches you a couple things are teaching you this one and remember to do this cover your whole sheet of paper spend a 15 minutes doing that without even drawing the darn thing Lay down that really light value, make it, make it very uh, uh, universal, right? Don't let it be, uh, don't want to let areas stick out from another. Really light marks, et cetera, et cetera. So you have this really light neutral value over the whole thing. You're not going to get, you're not going to have whites in your drawing per se that's any light than, lighter than that really neutral value that you can lay over the whole drawing, right? Um, for instance, let me see here. Read it, blah, blah, blah. If that's... So there's a couple examples, right, of 15 to, or 20 to 20 minutes to an hour or sorry, half hour of just scribbling, right? Mm -hmm. I showed you that, that I could pull a pair out of that ether <laughs> because it's so lightly drawn, right? You know, I'm not I'm not any one of these scribbles is not going to be disruptive to me. Uh, it's a really nice neutral, light neutral tone that I can start to play with, right? And I wouldn't have to erase on on either one of these, right? Okay. Um, so really light, and I would maybe scale the marks down a little bit. Th these are really beautiful marks, but maybe a little bit too big and too loopy, you know. But um, you don't want to go too big with them because you'll never get rid of them. Uh, and then, and the reason, David, is that you is you're sensitive to drawing without the aid of outline too, you know. So you have to, uh, you know, hold your feet to fire to the fire to have to deal with value, right? Blending, in other words. So. Uh, that's another reason that this works for you. So really light, co light coding for everyone and no erasing, okay? And that's another reason that you're not, uh, you know, that you're seeing more now because you know you don't have that luxury of erasing either, okay? So um, by the way, that scribble thing I was talking about, here's an example of the light bulb I did in the, st in the student work here. So not a bad drawing, but you can see totally neglected the background. Um, so the, the ball becomes darker. So maybe they didn't even have a white sheet of paper there. I'm not sure. Maybe they didn't play around with lighting. I don't know. But except for if you want to call the cast shadow background, you know, or it's ground other than a light bulb. So um, whereas over here, the bulb is defined by playing around this background. Now, it's not, it doesn't happen all at one time. It's got to be very lightly done so I can kind of shift and move the drawing as I go. Um, the other thing here, scribbles are large and heavy-handed, and you can't ex ex extract yourself from that because you can't erase, okay? So um, you can see where that can get you in trouble. And the scribbles are going in the direction of a particular form, like they're curving around this light bulb, for instance, right? Really long marks curving around that light bulb. Don't want you to do that. Those scribbles have to be independent of the form you're trying to render. Okay, you're just using those scribbles to create value in the drawing. Nothing more, nothing less. And laying them down and accumulating. 
You're not creating. Now in our con our contour, or I'm sorry, in our what do you call what's called a contour hatching, which lends itself to this what the student's doing here, or um, um, parallel hatching, which we'll do next drawing. That's a different issue, okay? But in this technique, it's just letting those scribbles be independent of any particular. Uh, you, you, I mean, they're hard to see here, but I don't do any scribble that is really, you know, tailored around a particular edge. You know, I'm not kind of scraping these lines like this, right? You know, they're just kind of floating there as independent. And I'm just stopping them short of where I perceive the edge of the form to be. So that's important, okay? Because I often see students just, just scribble, over, just go crazy with it. Now, it can be a nice way to make a drawing, right? But it's nice to know how not to do that, too. Right? So, so I'm trying to teach you that more nuanced approach here right now. Okay. Okay. So just read over this stuff. You know, this by the way is you can see see that curved blue line there, right? I kind of showed how it's not just a shadow going straight across this egg, but it's dipping down. Why would it dip why would the shadow, the dark modeling shadow on this egg dip down? Like a smiley face. See the core of that dark shadow is curved, dipping mm -hmm. down. Why would I do that? It's because of the shape of the egg. That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. The shadow is cast yep. based on the surface. Think about it. This area right here is closer to us, back to the ellipse, right? This area right here is closer to us then this area back here and this area back here where the tips of the egg are, right? And it's at the same level, it's just lo lower than my eye line, right? So it curves like an elliptical form would as it moves back in space because it's a curved form. It's not a pure ellipse, but it's a curved form. So it's gonna move back in space to the tip here and it's gonna move back in space to the tip here. This is where perspective comes in and structure, right? Not only that, but I'm getting a little bit of a three quarter view here. So the axis of this flat shape would be at an angle, right? Tip up here, tip down here. That's the problem. You can't forget all that stuff we spent a half a semester on. Not only that, but the proportion of the egg. I would, have, as I carve this thing out, you know, in its preliminary stages, I better be sure that the height of this egg is in proportion to its length. And I would measure it, and then I would apply it to my drawing, so I have that rough idea. Lots of stuff going on here, right? Okay. Um, and then it just never ends, <laughs> you know. But that makes you a better artist. You know, you're seeing the world that you, in a way you wouldn't see it otherwise. Okay, so I want just to show you one more thing and we'll talk about lighting. Um, so there's a video here in this uh, suite of videos that, um, well, this one I show the pace of the, somebody uh, uh, last fall on me. So I just do, that's how fast I'm working, maybe a little faster, but not much faster. Okay, so there's a video just kind of revealing that. I'm not drawing anything here, just showing, you know, it's like uh, what, uh, a couple minutes worth of just showing the pace of, of making the drawing. And see how light the pencil's in my hand, by the way. You can kind of see, I'm holding it, I mean, you can't really see, but I'm way down at the end of the pencil and it's just wiggling in my hand. Very light uh, uh, scribbles that I'm using there, okay? Um, see how the pencil moves in the hand? Right. And I'm just probing the drawing, just over here, over here, over here. No system, right? No system other than the kind of up, down, left, right kind of general movement. And in this one, I, I walked through a whole drawing. So I don't know, this was probably a 10 hour drawing or something like that. Um, and I, this is narrated, uh, so um, this one's sped up, of course, right? So there's how it starts. I mean, this is into it, this is about a third of the way in, but you gotta be patient. So there's the, I don't know. How long I'd worked on that drawing right there, but see the shape of the pear starting to emerge, right? Now in this drawing, I'm hanging out on the pear more more than I am the background because the pear is darker than the background, so I have the luxury of doing that in this drawing. Um, but it's that's not a, the light bulb. I couldn't do that. I had, had to hang out in the uh, background a little bit in the light bulb in order to start to render its edge. So just over time, you know, just kind of. I think that's like a two-hour mark there. So I spent. Maybe two hours? I don't know. I can't remember. It's been a long time. So let's go a little bit. So I'm slowly coming to terms with this thing as an entity. 
And it's not just like, yeah, that's just a pair. Yeah, but that pair is complex, right? It has a density and a weight and, you know, it has kind of atoms flowing around in there and a vibration and electricity in it. And, you know, so all this time this, that I'm spending kind of just gathering these marks allows me to know the pair better, allows me to see it better. Um, and that's important when you draw, okay? Where tr students generally get in trouble is they just, first thing hits them and they're done and it's gone, you know, that's it, you know. So if you want to do that, that's fine, but, you know, um, yeah, I don't want to say it without swearing, but uh, um, junk in, junk out, okay? Uh, you know, so it's your mindset. You got to get your mind kind of in the in right place to make a nuanced drawing, okay? That, and that means not junk in, right? That means like it, it, intention in it and attention in. Um, so just gathering marks, maybe I've shifted now to a little darker pencil and medium size, right? Now the closer I get to finish on this thing, the smaller the script is, right? So, so these edges are starting to kind of coalesce now, right? In fact, what I'll do, like you'll see it up here, I'll put a, just a little line in just because there's a dark area right there on the pair. And I'll backfill with scribbles, so the line will essentially disappear. It's coming up here real. See, I'm kind of laying a little line down there, and then just backfilling a little bit. So that's not that's an edge, not not a line. I put a line in there, and then just scribbled up to that line and backfilled into the pair. So it creates a roundness. I did do it in strategic areas, not all, not around the whole thing, but in areas because it was a little darker there. Right? I did it there, and I left this alone up here. Somewhere, yeah, I left a little gap here, right there. Left a little gap here, left a little gap here, over here. Not the whole thing, but just enough. Now, it's a different kind of objects, not the light bulb. So, you know, it's dark, darker, uh, you know, against the background. Anyways, so you get a sense watching this video of the, you know, how long it takes. Now, this is probably a, a 10, 10 hour drawing, something like that, you know. So, um, don't expect that darkness on your drawing, okay? But it g gives you a sense, anyways. Maybe, maybe you're drawing. Something like, well, maybe that. Uh, let's see what that looks like. That's pretty good. Maybe something like that. If that even, but. You may not be able to get that much darkness, but. Because if you rush it, it's going to look weird. It's going to look. Uh, Little, look rushed essentially okay okay so you got those videos to look at and then I have a little addendum here that you can read over if you want to that I just talk a little bit more about this 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 idea oh here's one I did I think I showed you guys this week or last week but this was like a 10 hour drawing so this gives you an example of two hours in five out two and a half hours two five hours seven and a half hours and you know by the end of the drawing you know addressing these edges a little bit more but no outline Okay, just kind of gathering marks along edge. And you don't have to fill everything in because, you know, the stem kind of disappears into the background here, but that's a nice rendering of a, of a stem of a pumpkin, right? Who, who, okay. uh, I, I, I'm curious, how did you manage to do the shading of the pumpkins? I, I, I don't know how to describe it. The, the ribs? The curves? Like the ribs. ribs. Yeah. Well, I looked carefully at what was going on. So let's. that's a really good, like, notice here, I don't think I have it here at all. So. Not nothing really here, right? So I didn't start dealing with that issue. That those are local value shifts. Okay, so thanks for asking that, David. That would be local value shifts versus global value shifts. So here I'm just dealing with the global value shifts. How dark's the pumpkin here versus the background, all that sort of stuff. Here I start to get into some local value shifts. Okay, <laughs> then as I move up here, definitely get a little bit more into it. And all that's happening here. That's a really good question. So this is surface texture, you know, um, and and that's a how how does the how does the surface undulate across the shape of the thing, right, essentially? Um, this is kind of pixelated here, but um, essentially what's happening here, okay, this is a little complex, but the light's coming from the left or the right in this scene, do you think? Left. Yeah, the left. So the light's coming in, right? This is a valley, right? These little ribs are valleys in the pumpkin. They are recessed areas in the pumpkin, right? 
Okay, so these bigger forms are sticking out, right? So you could probably assign a neutral value. Here's a little slight one right here, but you could assign a neutral value to the area that's sticking out. Okay, and then when the light's coming in, it's going to hit the surface here that's directly impacted by it, right? So light's coming in, raking across these neutral areas, so we get the neutral value, hitting that directly, and then the other side of the valley, valley is shaded relative to that, okay? That's in shadow. So all that lives in a local region that I have to be aware of relative to the whole drawing, right? I can't just kind of make these super dark here because that would be out of place for the whole drawing, these valleys, right? So you can kind of see three, you break it, there's a lot more in here, but you break it down to three separate values. Neutral on the big raised flat areas. Dark on the left side, that's being sheltered from the light. So thinking about your direction of light helps you navigate this stuff. And then highlight on the side that's getting the, direct, the light directly. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And then all that's encased in a value that is the pumpkin value in this drawing, right? That I have to kind of, so it gets real tricky, these local shifts. And I always see this with students, they'll, like we used to draw potatoes and they'll go in and put the scars in the potatoes and the scars will be like just lines with really dark. And then the, the drawing will be really nuanced other than that. And then those things stick out like a sore thumb, of course, but they're not seeing that until I point it out to them, right? Because they're, lose, they're just so enamored by that little scar they're trying to draw on the potato that, um, that they don't see that in the larger picture, right? The global value picture, okay? Remember at the beginning of the semester, I talked about seeing the forest through the trees, right? And we are not good at that as human beings, okay? So you gotta train yourself to see those larger relationships when it gets down to detail relationships. And so this would be a detail relationship, surface-based, textural-based relationship, okay? Does that help, David? Yeah, Okay. a lot, a lot actually. Okay, good, 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 thanks. That's a great question. Um, okay, let me show you a little bit about lighting here and then we'll send you on your way. Um, any other questions about all this stuff that I went over here? Before I get into that. Here I threw a little line in. Once you get understand that value, so there's like a tree root or something we were drawing. You know, the background here is lighter than the top of this. But I, then at the end of the drawing, I throw some kind of little contour line in there and it kind of pulls the whole thing together. I don't want you to do that in this drawing, but that is a, a technique, okay, to, to use. All right. Okay, so let me get back to the setup here. So I'm just going to uh, do a couple scenarios there, okay, to talk about lighting and objects uh, to choose. Uh, oh, let me get, I got to go get one thing, I forgot. Hang on a second. Okay, so I'm going to get Is that a dog, Stephanie, or a cat? Uh, it's my poodle. It's a poodle? Yes. <laughs> She's very um, needy, so she's yeah. down here like wanting me to throw a ball or do something. So I'm like, okay. I'll pick you up. Yeah, Aww, that's cute. My cat does that sometimes. I'm not allowed to be on the phone and not paying attention to him. You know. Yes, he I just jealous. Cats seem to know on cue. I see them often in Zoom calls. Or one of the other teachers I had, her cat would always come up the minute the class started, <laughs> get on the desk. You know. <laughs> They learn fast. <laughs> yeah. um, so here's a couple scenarios with lighting. Now, what I did, and I'd, I'd like you to do, is find a surface, and it has to be the right height, okay? So what I did here is I have a, a board that I set this piece of paper on, okay? And then all I did, you don't have to fold the paper, take a white sheet of paper, and just lean it against something vertical. In this case, I have like a camera case back there that I have, it's kind of hard to see, but back there. So I have more surface here than I do here, but just enough surface that I can have a clean view of this thing, okay? Um, which is a, a roll of toilet paper, by the way, if you didn't know that, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm gonna pop in here just to make sure I can kind of get the focus. Okay, um, okay, so we have the object. Now this would be a good object to draw because it has a volumetric round front there, right? Okay. Um, 
and a clean background that is essentially the same value as that. Okay. Um, now, when we did potatoes, I used brown paper for the students in the classroom. Um, that worked because the, it was essentially the same value and color. It, it did help because that issue of color you brought up, Christine, I think it was you, um, is an it, it important idea. Um, and that worked, right? So that might work, but you know, it's better probably just to use white paper since you have it, but you know, whatever. Anyway, so let's talk about direction of light. So which way is the light coming in on this uh, object here? From the left? Yep, from the left, right. Um, now tell me if the light is higher or lower. Higher. Yep, higher. How do you know that? Because the, sh uh, because the shadows become smaller going inwards. Yes, this shadow has shrunk. Right. And what else gives you that information? Let me go back. So lower view. Look at the look at the uh, toilet paper itself. So look at the value relationships uh, in the different surface. You got a horizontal surface. You got a vertical surface. Well, the, the top of the roll of paper is uh, light. Yeah. So the light's hitting that more more directly, right? Than it is the side now. Now, if I go even lower, look at how the top darkens and the side brightens. Okay, so how you control your drawing is really important. Now, can I, can I get this, light this in such a way that I have a nice dark value in the background on the left side and a light value on the right side aside from the cast shadow? That looks pretty good. I got dark versus light back here and light versus dark back here okay let's make the top of the towel disappear into the background if we can I don't know if we can but hmm. getting close see how nuanced lighting is <laughs> uh, let's see yeah now, how did I do that? I lit up the background more, right? So now my light's shining. I'm pushing the light, it's like right here, close to the background more. I wouldn't want that in the drawing. I'd want to have a distinct kind of dark light sort of thing happen in between background and foreground. So that's a little better, maybe. A little bit. You don't have the luxury of doing what I'm doing here, but you can use a lamp. You can use the window. The window's really nice. That's how I did that pumpkin drawing. But I just want to show you how uh, important lighting is here relative to background, okay? And relative to revealing the round or volumetric nature of the object, okay? Let's try to do something where it's boring. Okay. No volumetric revelation right there along that uh, front uh, surface. Where's the light coming from now? The front. Yep. In front of it. Right in front of it. That's right. Mm -hmm. So I'm not yeah, getting I'm not getting that, that modulation of value across the surface, rounded surface, right? And the reason I want you to do volumetric forms here is because I want it to be a form-based drawing. I want you to fixate on that idea of roundness. Okay. Whatever you choose to, to use. I'm gonna put a couple objects up here in a second. Sometimes I have students do this, a light from behind for whatever reason. And that's a cool image, but it's really hard to draw, and there's like just real subtle stuff going on here in the front. I wouldn't advise that if I were you, okay? Right. Okay. So you can see lighting changes everything dramatically. Those I showed you guys the last time, those Italian artists, did I show you their work the, with the skull and the stuff? Mm -hmm. David, you mentioned, didn't you mention you couldn't believe it was a drawing? Uh, kind of a little bit. I'll, I'll bring yeah. it back up again, but you'll see in, in I'll, I'll bring an example here after I light just to let you know how what a radically different uh, uh, change lighting makes in, in a drawing, okay? Okay, so there's the roll of toilet paper. Now you can see here, if you choose an object that's super dark and super shiny, you get a little bit maybe of, you know, some roundness here, but it's not gonna, um, 
it's like not there anymore, right? It's like just this dark thing on a white background. So I advise you not to use something that's too dark, okay? So the, the ye yellow app, what's it called? What kind of apple is that called? Golden Delicious. Golden Delicious. That would be a good drawing because it's lighter in value and rel relatively matte. It's not shiny. The other reason a Macintosh is not good because it's super shiny. Um, so that causes glare issues and then you're losing also that the light's hitting the shiny surface and bouncing back and you're not getting a sense of the, the undulation across the form. That's why we painted the light bulbs for one reason because the glass was shiny and also it was translucent. So if you have a real shiny object that presents a problem. Let's look at an avocado. Not so good. See that shiny? You know, all I'm seeing is like shiny light. I'm not seeing any undulation across the surface because it's dark and shiny. Okay? So an avocado wouldn't be good. Banana probably would be good. Okay? And they don't have to have vegetables and fruit, but here's a lemon. Um, that's better. It's a little shiny, but that's better, right? So I could probably manipulate that in such a way that I could start to get a really nice, um, really kind of minimalist look to the drawing, right? So that the left side is a little lighter than the background now. Definitely the dark, the right side is darker than the background. I'm getting a little dark cast shadow. See that little bit of a reflected light under here too? Right there, right? The light's hitting, coming down, hitting the paper and bouncing back up underneath. So that would be a pretty good, you'd have to blow it up, make a big, I don't want a drawing that has a little bit, a little tiny thing in a big field of nothing. Don't do that. Make it bigger than life size, okay? Fill up your composition. Think about that when I, the egg drawing I did, right? I made that definitely bigger than life size. And then we talk about color. Yeah, color is an issue. So it's dark and it has color. So how do you differentiate that? I have, I put this in black and white, right? So. Um, the camera's helping me out with that. But yeah, that's a really good question. Uh, Judy, you asked, somebody asked that, uh, or somebody asked about color. Was that Christine? I'm not sure. Um, and that's a tough one. So you just got to kind of block color out if you can, or choose something that is white or neutral or like like gray or, you know, that doesn't have a lot of color in it, no pattern, no letters, no words. Uh, like, don't draw a coffee mug with words on it, okay? Uh, I see that happen a lot. Um, or an emblem or insignia or whatever. Um, so you got to pick the right object or objects you want to do too. Uh, white onion is nice. That's what that other thing was in the pumpkin drawing I did was a white onion. Um, so are there any questions about lighting here and how to set it up? Now, in order to make this paper not move, you could tape the, you know, the front two sides down here, right? Just kind of tape it down to the surface of the table or whatever. But get yourself in a good place in terms of the setup, okay? Whatever that means to you, however you can.